We are walking through the New Testament, walking through each book, starting with the Gospels and then Acts. And now we're halfway through the epistles of Paul. He wrote 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament. We've looked at Romans. We've looked at 1st and 2nd Corinthians. We've looked at Galatians and Ephesians. And today we're going to look at Philippians. What a letter. Oh my goodness, I love this. Paul wrote this, just to give you a little background, he wrote it around 62 to 63, so about 30 some years after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. Of course, he wrote it to a church in Philippi. It was the first church that was ever established in Europe. If you remember Acts chapter 16, it's where the story is, where Paul received a vision of a man in Macedonia, modern day Greece, saying, come over and help us. And Paul and his crew crossed the Aegean Sea and went over and went to Philippi first, because Paul was always strategic, looking for cities, population centers of influence to plant the gospel. And he plants the gospel in Philippi, a major Roman colony, very thick Roman culture, met a prominent woman that I kind of envisioned as being pretty feisty for some reason. I don't know why, but her name was Lydia. She was a prominent woman, an influential woman, had a lot of business contacts and was very just affluent and influential. Also, this is where we learn about the Philippian jailer. Paul and Silas were thrown into jail on one of their many occasions and God brought a miraculous earthquake at midnight as Paul and Silas were singing praises to God. Just an amazing series of events and the jailer ends up and his whole family surrendering his life to Christ. And uh, it's just an incredible part of the scriptures. And so Paul is writing to this church that he he established there, and he's writing it from another prison cell, a Roman prison cell. Bless that boy's heart. He couldn't find his way out of of jail very often, but it's a thank you note. In a lot of ways, it's a lot more than that, but he's thanking the Philippians for a wonderful gift that they had just sent him by way of a young man named Epaphroditus. And we'll learn some really cool things about him as we walk through this. It's a very unique letter in the way it's constructed. Different from anything else Paul wrote in this sense. The whole thing kind of hinges on and is built around a poem in chapter 2. Now, I call it a poem. Some people call it a hymn, or it could even, I guess, kind of be looked at as a modern-day psalm. It, it is a piece in chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, that is really carefully crafted, and it's art, and it's poetic, and it's beautiful. And it encapsulates the incarnation and the birth of Christ and his humbleness in coming as a servant and laying his life down on a cross and how as a result of all of that, God lifted him up and exalted him and gave him the name above every other name. So worth memorizing. And Paul kind of builds this letter around this poem. And even in the passages before and after, he's constantly referring back to or drawing from some piece of this poem. And his point is the life of a disciple, the life of someone who follows Christ should reflect the attitude and the behaviors that we see in Christ in those verses. And we'll see that again and again as we walk through this. So there's four chapters, starting with chapter one. Paul opens up with expressions of thanks to the church for the gift that they had given him and a declaration about God's active, ongoing, forever work in our daily lives. He opens up and says, I'm so thankful for you and for the gift that you have given me, supplying my needs. And he refers to the Philippians as being partners with him in the gospel. It's a really cool phrase. I don't think if I did a study, maybe there is another place, but this is, I think, the only place he refers to believers in this way because of their generosity and the way they had cared for him, financially supporting the work. And so I want to take just a moment and help you to think about your stewardship. We think about that in terms of finances a lot, but it's really broader than that. Paul here kind of makes the case that when we support gospel ministry with our dollars, we're partnering with that ministry. We exert our effort and our energies and our gifts to create this income, and then we give it to support. And Paul says, that's a beautiful thing. That's an awesome thing. That's an essential part of ministry. Paul could not have done what he did without God's people supporting him in this way. The other side of the coin, though, and this is just something, whenever you think about stewardship, it's good to think about both sides of this, is time and abilities and service. And we need to do that. The thing is, we need to really safeguard ourselves against falling into only one side on either side. We can fall into this mindset of just kind of throwing dollars at things, and that's massive, but not serving. And we're shortchanging ourselves if we do that. 
in addition to the kingdom of God, because spiritual growth involves getting skin in the game and getting off the bench and getting involved in using our gifts and talents and serving the master and the king. So we need to do that. The other side of the coin is we need to not hold back from giving our treasure. There's no dollar amount. We give what the Lord has laid on our heart. But growing in generosity is part of the Christian faith. I have encountered people who have said, kind of almost with a, a sense of pride, hey, you know, I, I don't give any financial gifts. I, I, my time, my service, that, that's my time. It's like, well, that's part. But we don't, again, we, we don't want to fall off on either side. They both matter. They're all part. The, the service and the financial contribution, partnering with our whole life in the gospel. Philippians 1, 4 through 6, Paul says, In all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy. Joy is a major theme throughout this letter. Joy in the Lord. So I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel with me from the first day until now. And then here's this statement about God's work in our life. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you. When did that begin? When we re- received Christ. When we stepped over and were born again in Christ, God began this new good work in us and he will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That day is the day of Christ's return. He's going to carry it on every single day. God is continually working in our lives, transforming us more and more into the likeness and character and image of his son. Paul talks about this all the way through all of his letters. Ashley mentioned Romans 8 earlier in the service that we can know, Romans 8, 28, that God is at work in all things, our best weeks and our hardest weeks, and everything in between. He's at work in all things for the good. And we learn in that context that the whole point of good is the work of making us more like our Savior. For the good of those who love him, are, love him and are called according to his purpose, God's always working. Last week in Ephesians, we saw that God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than all we could ever ask or even imagine. Chapter 3, verse 20. According to his awesome power that is at work in us. He's always at work, and we could go on and on. Paul expresses this in so many ways. But he is at work transforming us, making us more, and he will do this to that day. As you read Paul's letters as a whole, he comes back to this again, and he'll come back to it again in in Philippians in a moment. This day that Christ will come, the trumpet will sound, Christ will appear, the dead in Christ will rise. That is, those who died with faith in Jesus. And we'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And these old corruptible bodies will give way, and we'll be given these glorified bodies, and we will be like him. How awesome is that? There's kind of like this undercurrent all the way through the book to remind them, I know you live in this world. I know the news is ugly. But I want to continue to remind you, you're not of this world. Keep your eyes on eternity. Keep your eyes on heaven. That's going to come up again and again. And next then, he wants to give them a report about his conditions in that Roman prison cell. And he's joyful. He's joyful to report that his adversity has served to advance the kingdom. If you will, Paul's saying, yeah, I know I'm in, I'm in prison again. But it's good because it's, it's advancing the gospel. Paul embodies what he's calling them to. He's like, yeah, my circumstances are not so good, but it's all good in Jesus because it's moving the needle in the right direction. Jesus is being glorified. All the Roman guards know about Jesus now. They're chained to me. They're a captive audience. I know we're going to end up meeting Roman guards in heaven. I can't wait to meet my first one. Who says, yeah, I'm here because Paul, man, he just wouldn't quit telling me about Jesus. It's going to be awesome. He also says many Christians outside are more bold now to speak for Christ because of my chains, because of my circumstance. He's cautiously optimistic that he will eventually be set free, but he also realizes that he might be executed. And as he thinks about that in Philippians 1, verses 20 through 25, he says, I eagerly expect and I hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but that I will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ, listen to this, Christ will be exalted In my body, you've got to understand Paul's perspective on the body to really appreciate that. Paul had a Genesis 1 understanding of the triune creation God made us to be as people, as human beings. It's good for you to pause and understand that you are a spirit and that you live in a body and you have a soul. Your soul is why you're different from the person beside you. Your soul is why you might laugh at a joke and another person might say, that's dumb. Because you're unique. It's you. You have a spirit. We worship God in spirit and in truth. And our body is a tool. Now in Genesis 1, before the fall, 
Adam and Eve, the spirit was in the forefront. The spirit was alive and dynamic. It's why they could walk with God in the cool of the garden with unbroken fellowship. But as soon as sin entered the world, what did God tell them would happen as soon as they ate the fruit? You will surely die. Well, the serpent, he's great at splitting hairs and and rewriting the fine print. And he says, you won't die. And he means your flesh, it'll keep living, but your spirit will die. That's what God was talking about. That's God's main concern. Your spirit will die and you will not have relationship with me. And as soon as they ate that fruit, shame came upon them and they died spiritually and they heard the sound of God and instead of running to him, they ran and hid. You see what happened in that moment was their spirit died and the flesh took over. Now we're slaves to our flesh. Paul talks about this all the way through. This is why the gospel is so awesome because it's in the gospel, Jesus talked about it in John 3, that we must be born again. When we're born of the Spirit, we're regenerated and that part of us that was dead because of sin is brought back to life. Now we can have a relationship with God because we're alive in our spirit again. Do you see that? So Paul says the body's great, but the body's a tool. That's all the body is. It's a tool. The body, this body is not me. When this dies, Brad will go right on living. It's beautiful. But so Paul has this mindset of the body. It's a tool. So he says, I have great hope that I will always have sufficient courage that Christ will always be exalted in everything I do in the body. Romans 12, 1, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice to Christ. That's that's what worship is. Whether by life or by death, whether they kill my body or let it live, I pray that Christ will always be exalted. For to me, to live in this body, it it is Christ. It It is service to him. To die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. Here's Paul's plan. This is Paul's plan A. I desire to depart. I'm ready to check out of this body and go be with Christ, which is better by far. Oh, hear that. Hear that. We get so worried about this this world and this life. Paul had a much bigger perspective. I desire to be apart from the body and with Christ, which is better by four. But now here's where he begins to think about the poem we're about to read here in a minute. But I know it is more necessary for you. Not me. It's not my plan. It's not my desire. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and for your joy in the faith. This is Paul, and you'll see it in a moment, saying, I want to be like Christ. I want to lay Paul on the, on the altar for the glory of God. Philippians 127, he says, whatever happens then, and here he's addressing the Philippians, and he's saying, whatever happens in your life, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Live in the same way that I'm wanting to glorify God no matter what happens, you do this too. He's calling the Philippians to this. The Philippians lived in a Roman hotbed of patriotism. I mean, loyalty to Rome was everything. And any mention of loyalty to another king would bring swift persecution, especially King Jesus. And so Paul is writing them, be strong. Remember, keep your focus where it needs to be. If persecution comes, be loyal to Jesus. Verse 29 For it has been granted, this is wild language, we don't think like this, okay? It's been granted to you. It's a gift. It's a wonderful thing. God has given you this blessing on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Paul says that's a good thing. It's a beautiful thing because when we suffer with Christ, when we walk through the valley for our faith, we grow in intimacy with God like we never do in any other time. And if your eyes are on eternity, this is just a blip. And all of our momentary troubles, like Paul says in 2 Corinthians in the theme verse of my life, they're achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Living for Jesus oftentimes puts us at odds with the culture. It always does. It certainly did in Philippi. It certainly does in America. Their situation was much like ours. Faith is great. Yeah, believe what you want. Just keep it private. It's fine for you to believe all those things about God. Just don't actually get the notion that you're going to live it out in a way that will impact your culture. I'm glad you believe in Jesus, just don't bring it to work. I'm glad you believe in Jesus, just don't express it in school. Which kind of goes against like the whole thing of go into the world and make disciples, right? So it's kind of unavoidable. And Paul's just painting, he's saying, look, I know you live in this culture. I know you live in this thing where you're going against the flow. But be bold and be strong and know that if you suffer, it's a good thing. Because you don't have this temporary mindset, you have an eternal one. And it's growing you up in Christ and bringing glory to God. Chapter 2, here's where we get into the poem. And then he gives a couple examples of, of people that are living it out. Here it is. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset, that is the same attitude, the same perspective as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, that's who he was, that's who he is. 
He did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage or to be grasped or clung to. By the way, it's exactly the opposite of Satan. Satan wanted nothing more than to grab power, to cling to power, to exalt himself. It's exactly why he was cast out of heaven. It's exactly what Adam and Eve did in the garden. The serpent told Adam and Eve, he knows that when you eat that fruit, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God. You'll be like him. Exalting self. Jesus is the opposite of exalting self. He's the opposite of sin. He he says, oh, I got all the power in the world. I'm sitting on the throne, but I'll let go of it. I'll just let it all go. He said, rather, he made himself. Nobody did this to him. He made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. The Son of God emptied himself, was born, and let people beat on him and spit on him and beat him to within an inch of his life and strip him naked, nail him to a piece of wood and hold him up for the whole world to gawk at him and eventually to die. One of the most painful deaths of suffocation you can ever experience. Wow. Therefore, Paul says, God exalted him to the highest place and he gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow or every knee should bow (laughs) in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge or every tongue confess, literally will agree with God, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. How beautiful is this? Now, that exaltation part at the end is very interesting. Of course, Jesus will always be Lord. He will always be the Lamb worshipped in eternity. But there is a principle here, and James picks up on it in chapter 4, verse 10. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself. Don't be made to be humble. But humble yourself. Choose to lay yourself down, and he will lift you up. You humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will raise you up for his purposes. He will raise you up in a way that you will know you're being used by him for his glory. Philippians 2, verses 14 through 16, here springboarding off this poem and this reference about Jesus, he says, do everything without grumbling or complaining or or, or arguing. Jesus didn't grumble. Jesus didn't argue. Be like him so that you may become, oh, I love this, you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and broken generation. Does that not apply to our world? Then you will shine among them like stars in the night sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. Now, if you grew up in the city, you don't really appreciate this. You got to get outside of all the artificial light some night in the middle of nowhere and look up at a clear, cloudless sky and see the glory of the stars. And Paul says, listen, as you live like this, serving Christ in the middle of this broken, corrupt, crooked generation, holding to the word... You'll shine like stars on a dark night among your culture. Jesus said it this way, you're the light of the world. And then he gives these examples of Timothy and Epaphroditus in verses 19 through 24. He says, Timothy has a genuine concern for others. He said, I don't have anybody like him. As a matter of fact, in this department, he has this genuine, genuine concern for the welfare of others. And he left everything. He didn't cling to his home and his comfort. He left everything behind to come with me and to go on this journey and to present the gospel, oftentimes in hostile situations, and to give his life to care for the people of God in the church. What an example. He's following the example of Christ. You can follow his example in your life as well. Then Epaphroditus in verses 25 through 30, Paul calls Epaphroditus, this was the young man who brought the gift to him from the church in Philippi. He calls him a brother in the Lord and a fellow soldier in the good fight. And he says he became, he says, I want you to know, church in Philippi, that your brother Epaphroditus became very ill on his mission bringing this gift to me, and he almost died in service to the king. So I says, I'm sending him back to you, and indeed he can't wait to come back to you, and he wants you to know he's okay now. But he says, treat him with the honor and respect that he deserves, because he truly was willing to lay his life down for this mission within the kingdom. Again, what a great example of a brother following the example of Jesus, laying self aside. Chapter 3. Paul then turns to his own example. In verse 1, he starts the chapter by saying, Rejoice. This happens again and again. Rejoice in the Lord. So good for Christians just to remember, to break that phrase down. Rejoice in the Lord. He's with me. He loves me. He's got this. He's got me. It's all moving in a direction toward glory. It's achieving for me an eternal glory that far outweighs all the momentary troubles and challenges that I'm facing. 
I rejoice in the Lord. But then he quickly transitions in chapter 3 with a warning. And as only Paul can say it, he says, watch out for those dogs. That's what he calls the Judaizers. The Judaizers, we've talked about them numerous times. He said the, the Jewish people who seem to follow Paul wherever he goes, they infiltrate the church and they try to pull people away from a pure devotion to Christ back into the old covenant. To get their eyes back on the old covenant and the works of the flesh and the works of the law and this legalistic approach to salvation. Say, Jesus is great, but you got to do all this and this and this and this and this and this and this too in order to be saved. Paul says confidence in the flesh, is a, it's terrible. It's a path to just killing your faith. So Paul says in Philippians, and he starts to share his own story, Philippians 3 verses 4 through 14. Paul says, if someone else, I just, I love Paul. I'll just say this. I love the way he speaks here. If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. I just love this. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He's walking through his pedigree, which was like the peak of the peak for an Israelite to be able to do this. He's saying, man, I'm royalty in this department. I mean, I've got it all down in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Can you say faultless about any part of your life? I can't. Paul says, hey, legalistic righteousness, I nailed it. 10 out of 10. But here's where he begins to focus on the mindset of the poem and the example of Christ. Whatever were to my gains, I now consider loss. Not just nothing. Worse than nothing. Bad. Detriment. Why? Because the things that we point to as our spiritual moments, our great highs, our list that we would brag about, they become temptations for us to put confidence in that instead of in Jesus alone. Paul says, all my pedigree I consider not just nothing but a loss because there were so many times along the path where I was tempted to put my my hope in that. So I consider that a loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness that comes from my own, that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, not just about him. I want to know him down to the fibers, the deepest fibers of my being. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. Listen to this. And the participation in his sufferings. Paul lifts this up periodically. When you go through the deepest, darkest moments, those moments when you have a thorn in your flesh and you cry out to God and you say, I can't take it anymore. Take it away from me. And he comes back and says, my grace is sufficient for you. You come away from those moments with a deeper revelation and understanding of the power and the goodness and the faithfulness of God than any mountaintop could ever give you. And a lot of times you can't even express it to other people. It's just an imprint on your heart that carries you through the next valley. It's powerful. Paul says, I want that. I want to to know and walk with Christ. And listen to this, becoming like him in his death. How was he in his death? Totally surrendered. Totally poured out. The ultimate expression of selflessness, not about me. Paul says, that's what I want. I want to be there, whatever it takes. And so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now, not that I've already attained all this, Paul says, starting in verse 12, or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Love that phrase. Paul never forgot and told often his story. I was just walking along the road to Damascus one day. Bam! Jesus reached out and said, you're mine. He never forgot it. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, this is my mindset, this is my MO, so I live my life forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Straining toward what is ahead. Boy, there's a lot of intentionality in that and on purposeness. I press toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Listen, someone here today, I believe with all my heart, you need to hear this. 
What are you holding on to? What tape do you keep playing over and over and over and over in your head? You're trying to figure it out. You're trying to fix it. Let it go. Put it against the backdrop of eternity. Does it really matter in the light of eternity? If it matters in the light of eternity, press into it and ask God for your strength and he'll give it to you. If it doesn't, let go and press on, refocus on Jesus. Onward and upward, my friend. Paul says, follow my example in this area. Always remember, Paul says, as you live in this world, as you navigate in this world, there are all kinds of enemies of the cross. Many enemies of the cross is the phrase he uses. And he says, you'll know them right off because their mind is set on earthly things. They're not thinking about eternity. They're not thinking about the kingdom. It's all about now and here. That's what drives them. Success, power, whatever. It's all about their life and right now. Paul says, be aware. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. Your citizenship is in heaven. That's your whole whole orientation. And we eagerly wait a savior from there. The Lord Jesus, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Wow. Can't wait for that day. We're back to this whole thing. Keep your eyes fixed on the prize. There's coming a day. The Lord's going to come and all wrongs will be righted and we'll be raised and we'll be transformed and we'll be with him forever. So live like people who know that. You know, you face the big giant, you're like, oh, but then when you see behind the giant, God in eternity, you're like, bring on the giant. It's like David, you know, no worries. It's fantastic. Chapter four, final chapter. Paul says in this chapter, choose peace. Did you know peace is a choice? Boy, the enemy wants you to think, no, you're driven by your feelings. You can't control them. They just come, and they do come, but you still have a choice, right? Choose peace through Christ. So he pauses just for a moment to address a rift in the church at the beginning of the chapter. There's these two other prominent women who I kind of see in the same way that I see Lydia. They're named Yodia and Syntyche. They're obviously influential women in the church, and they're having a, a spat. They're fighting, and it's influencing the church. So Paul takes a moment to call their attention back to the poem. He says, y'all need to sit down with the fact that your Lord emptied himself and submitted himself to the Father and said, it's not about me at all. And Paul says, I'm confident, ladies, as you both pour yourselves, your own desires, put them aside and only think about the kingdom, you'll be able to work this out. So many, almost every disagreement I've ever been in with people is about competing what I want versus you know, what you want and all that. And let's lay that aside and see what Jesus wants. It's huge. So Paul says, listen, I know that living in this broken, corrupt, crooked world, man, it can be challenging and there will be many times when you'll be tempted to be anxious. But here's what he says in Philippians 4, 4 through 7. And this is instruction from the Lord. This isn't just Paul's advice. Rejoice, i.e. choose to rejoice. He's not saying just, oh, I just don't feel like rejoicing. No, choose to rejoice in the Lord. I'll say it again. Rejoice. (laughs) This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Let your gentleness be evident to all. You see, when you know that the Lord's got you and he's got the circumstance, you can walk through it in calmness and gentleness. Because the Lord is near. Not only is he living within you by his spirit, but he's coming soon. Do not be anxious. What an interesting phrase. Again, it goes against, it cuts against our human nature. We think, well, anxiety is just something that comes. No, 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 no. Don't be anxious. It's helpful to know that the word anxiety means to be divided in your thinking. One foot over here trusting God. God, you got this. One foot over here trusting self. Oh, what can I do to fix this? And when you're torn between the two, of course you're anxious. Paul says, don't be double-minded about anything, but in everything, in every situation, by prayer. What's he doing here? He's calling our attention squarely, 100% back to being on God. Through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God with thanksgiving. You know, before you ever ask anything, if you take 10 minutes and just say, thank you for salvation. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you that you're the creator of all things. Thank you for your word that never changes. Thank you that you've forgiven all my sins, that you've lavished me with your grace. Just take some time to rehearse all the things that God has done for you. And man, you'll have a whole different perspective coming into you, presenting your requests. You'll have more confidence. You'll have more joy. So present your request to God with this thanksgiving and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Wow. Yep, the storm's still raging, but I'm good. Philippians 4, 
8 and 9. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely or admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on purpose, intentionally, continuously about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. Use my example of following Christ and the God of peace will be with you. And then finally, Paul closes. He thanks them again for the gift, for their partnership with him in the gospel. And he wants them to know that his adversity, his chains, his beatings, his struggles, his shipwrecks, his everything, that his adversity had been a great teacher in his life. He wants them to know this so that they can see the adversities in their life as great teachers. He wants us to see the adversities in our life as a great teacher. What does it teach? Well, Paul says, here's what it taught me. I learned, no matter what, how to have genuine contentment in Christ that the world can't touch. There are no circumstances that can steal the joy and the peace and the contentment I have in Christ. That's what my adversities have taught me. And that's what I want you to learn, Paul would say. Philippians 4, 11 through 13, I've learned to be content. No matter what the circumstances, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. But I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And here is the secret. I can do all this through Him who gives me strength. Beautiful. I might say that's one of the most abused verses in Scripture. (laughs) I can do all things through Christ. I can do anything. Uh, That's not what he's talking about. He's saying when you're in the bottom of the bottom of the barrel, you can find contentment through his power. That's so great. So he thanks them one more time for the gift. And and he's doing this on purpose like this because he's saying, look, through you, God provided all my needs. I want you to understand that you're an extension of God's hand. He worked through your generosity to provide all my needs. And then this is the last passage we'll read because it's the closing words that Paul shares. And he wants them to know, and my God, who is your God as well, he will also... Meet all of your needs, just like he's met mine, according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To God the Father be glory forever and ever. Amen.